This session actually also represents the launch of a new science business declaration on global cooperation. The declaration has been shaped, inspired and influenced by our technology strategy board. And you can read more information about this board on our website. Or if you're accessing this through the event platform, there is a space in the exhibition area. On both of those sites also, you are able to now access the declaration, which has just been launched as, we are, as I'm speaking right now. Uh, you may also have received a notification about it in your inbox. We're trying to generate a wide discussion on this topic. Um, so please, please use the discussion forum or comment on our website because we really would like your feedback, not just on this declaration itself, but on the entire topic of international collaboration and cooperation and competition. So we will be collecting all of your feedback, all of your comments, synthesizing them and then presenting them back to our technology strategy board in order to shape some more events down the line and other activities. We will also publish an event, uh, publish an article in the coming weeks, which gives a su summary of all of your comments. So I would like to thank the Technology Strategy Board members, all of them for their input and their time spent on, on this declaration. And we have one member of our board uh, here today to tell you a lot more about it, the reasons behind it, the background and the personal re reflections on why it's so important. So we have Stefan Kaufmann, who is a member of the German Bundestag, who will give us a 10 minute reflection on, on those points. And then immediately after that, we have two other eminent guests. We have Remy Quirion, who's chief scientist at the Provence of Quebec. And we have Henry Wang, who's founder and president of the Center for China and Globalization. So in the true kind of global spirit, we'll be discussing this in a very, very global format. So Stefan, over to you uh, to give your personal reflections. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gail, for the invitation and uh, friendly um, introduction. Yes, the COVID-19 pandemic has made clear that science is essential for tackling the great challenges of our society. The invial invaluable role of scientists in the fight against the pandemic and their incredible success in developing anti-COVID-19 vaccine, vaccines have shown how important close international coordination, joint efforts, data exchange and open science are for the field of research and innovation. However, the global pandemic has also demonstrated how fragile uh, global supply chains can be. For example, at the beginning of the pandemic, we faced a great shortage in the supply of personal protect protective equipment in Europe. And today we experience a vaccine shortage. On top of that, independent of the corona pandemic, global procurement gets more difficult due to increased protectionism. As a result, the calls for technology sovereignty in Europe, but also the, in the other regions of the world become louder every day. Together with the other members of the Science Business Technology Strategy Board, we intensively discussed these developments in our meetings. We agreed that the corona pandemic has put a strong spotlight on and amplified that uh, the already existing tension between two conflicting priorities in the field of research and innovation, the need for openness and the need for security. On the one hand, we need our scientists to continue to collaborate with each other worldwide so science can advance faster, be free and accessible to everyone. On the other hand, leaders around the world need to ensure that innovations are applied first at home so, so that they are able to provide job, health and social security for the citizens. Moreover, companies want their valuable intellectual property to be protected. Our future prosperity and well-being depend on how we find the right balance between these two priorities. We as members of the Technology Strategy Board believe that we need to address this issue at the international level. Therefore, we decided to initiate this declaration and call for a rethink on how we draw the difficult lines between protected and open science and innovation for the benefit of humanity. I think this declaration fits very well in the context of the discussions around technology sovereignty in Europe. However, it is important that the question of technology sovereignty is discussed in a differentiated manner. 
The focus on the discussions must lay on how to strengthen technology in Europe and how to define more clearly the conditions under which technology will thrive. That means that we have to find ways for the 27 EU member states with their different cultures and research and innovation systems to work together more effectively, generating a larger and more unified technology ecosystem. The Council conclusions of November 27, 2020, together with the Commission's communication entitled A New Era for Research Innovation, are two key milestones in EU efforts to build a common research area that is more impactful for researchers and innovators and more tangible for citizens throughout Europe. By strengthening the European research area, we can expand EU's technological sovereignty and thus develop a more confident Europe, which can both collaborate and compete on a global stage. The Bonn Declaration on Freedom of Scientific Research adopted in October 2020 underlines EU's strong commitment to open science. The Council's conclusion of November 27 come to complement uh, it by highlighting the importance of a continued openness to international collaboration for achieving the goals of the new era and supporting Europe's role as a global leader. This proves that Europe has committed to a model of open strategic autonomy when it comes to science and innovation. Nevertheless, how exactly this model would look like in practice, it's not quite clear yet. In this context, it is essential to define the principles which allow us to keep this delicate balance between freedom of research and technological sovereignty. In order to achieve that, the principles by which innovations and research are shared or kept need to be updated. We need to rethink the way we handle global research and innovation. And that is exactly what the Technology Strategy Board wants to achieve through this declaration. I personally support the declaration because I believe that we need other principles to guide our research and innovation in the 2020s and 2030s. Then these ones that guided our research and innovation activities, for instance, in the 80s or 90s. The global challenges, for instance, in the um, uh, we face nowadays, distinguish themselves from the ones we faced a couple of de de uh, decades ago. Our needs to do uh, as well. Since research and innovation are crucial in tackling these challenges and fulfilling our needs, it is therefore essential to update our way of handling research and innovation too. It is also clear that the conflict between more technology sovereignty on the one hand and the economic model based on global specialization, division of labor and open trade on the other hand is deepening every day. Therefore, we need clear international guidelines that allow research and innovation to be generally open, but also be closed in some areas. This updated framework of guidelines for doing global research and innovation should, however, be developed by scientists, industry representatives, politicians, and members of the civil society all together. Because only when these guidelines find the acceptance of all stakeholders, they can, be, they can ensure that research and innovation provide equitable humanitarian and sustainable solutions to the current global challenges. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stefan. And I recognize many of your words there, not just in the declaration itself, but in our, in our meetings that we've had to discuss this topic. So thank you. Um, I'm delighted to, to, to have a, a two, two people who are not in Europe looking out, but outside Europe looking in. So it's really interesting now, I think, to have a different perspective. So Remy, would you like to start off and maybe give us a few reflections on, on this call for, for a declaration and whether you think it's necessary, what you think of it um, and your, your perspectives generally? Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, Gail. I really appreciate the invitation. Pleasure, uh, pleasure to be with all of you this morning for Mon Montreal time is the morning. Uh, in a nutshell, I agree with uh, the declaration and the need to rethink uh, global research and innovation, open versus closed innovation. It's amazing to think that uh, global 
uh, IP uh, law and rule date back to 1883. So certainly the challenge today are quite a bit different from uh, a century or more ago. Just think of uh, digital economy, artificial intelligence, climate change, uh, the big uh, GAFA, et cetera, et cetera. But personally today, I will focus more on the openness, on open innovation and on collaboration over a security in order to face the huge challenge in store for us in the coming year, not even decade. Why am I saying that? That's probably because I spent uh, the past uh, year dealing with the COVID pandemic on a daily basis. And as was already mentioned by, by Stefan, dealing with uh, not having enough mask, not having enough ventilator, and now challenge in relation to, to vaccine. But when I think about science, innovation, what I like to remember from, uh, from the past year is the discovery and the development of vaccine. So just tremendous. If someone had told me last March or last February, that in less than a year, we have many vaccines that already will have been tested and now uh, given to uh, people all over the world. So that's just amazing. And I think there's a big part of it is related to open innovation, to open science. As soon as the sequence of the virus was known, it was put by Chinese investigator on the website. A lot of partnership between scientists, of course, in academia all over the world, but also the private sector and academia. What government in various countries have invested in the development of vaccine in partnership with the private sector is quite amazing, quite unheard of. So the partnership there was quite successful. Let's take, for example, the one in the state between the NIH and the industry there. So extremely successful. Now a bit of a challenge as was already mentioned. Yeah, we have global agreement. Yes, we provide vaccine to various countries worldwide, but when there is not enough of the vaccine, the doses then start to close border. And that's not acceptable. Need to be, should be for common good. And these vaccines should be available to everyone north and south. So I think we need to think about the rule, the law globally to make it more open, uh, especially facing the next big challenge. We think that pandemic is big, climate change will touch us even more and at all level and of course everywhere in the world. So I think uh, we need to make sure that science is open, that innovation is open if we want to succeed in the huge challenge facing us just related to climate change as well as uh, other challenges. And in closing, it was already mentioned, some of the key players that must be at the table, government, of course, scientists, uh, scientific uh, granting uh, organization, but for me, as critical is member of civil society. So the citizen need to be at the table so that to make sure that the type of uh, strategy that will be developed will be acceptable for our citizen. And I think by including citizen, will come up with very innovative solution that probably just among us as scientists or government leader who will not have been able to, uh, to uh, think about. So uh, that's a bit of a, my reflection regarding the declaration today. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, I mean, I think also um, in the context of civil society, openness, transparency is very important for gaining public trust in, in in, in science and innovation and technology development. So I, I, I definitely support you there. So um, it's morning in, in Canada and uh, Henry, uh, bedtime in, in Beijing, is it? Uh, or, or dinner time? Uh, <laughs> so anyway, uh, over no, to I, you. Uh, okay. Yeah, thank you, Gary. <laughs> uh, it's about 10, 10, quarter past 10 uh, in Beijing. Uh, no, I think this is a, a very good, uh, timely discussion. Uh, I want to thank organizer for, for inviting me. And I, I think this is really uh, a great time to reflect and also to, to think about uh, 
uh, the openness uh, uh, of this uh, declaration. I think it's really a good initiative. It is really at a good timing. And then we are now, uh, you know, the human uh, kind is already in the 21st century. We have uh, seven <laughs> or eight billion of the population uh, around the world now. We, we had the uh, uh, digital economy, we had the pandemic, climate change. So we, the human race has to really work together to combine all our technology and our innovation and the freedom of, of open for that. So, so I think the, uh, whether it's open or uh, closed, a call for uh, rethink the way we handle global research and innovation is absolutely crucial. Uh, so, so I think we are getting into the year, we're getting into the time uh, that uh, we really have to be uh, working together because we're so connected. We're connected by the trade, we're connected by the people-to-people -people exchanges, by tourism, by student exchanges, by, by all the innovation that we have to work together. So I think uh, even this pandemic fighting is, is such a good example. If we do not have a, a vaccine that is universal, uh, applicable to all uh, human beings, we are not really uh, win the battle yet. So, so I think absolutely uh, right call for that. And I think from my personal point of view, I, I would like to just say a few uh, 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 perspective probably. But the first is that uh, we really need to strengthen the uh, global R&D together. I think because uh, uh, this COVID-19 has served as a good example, we have to uh, have all the uh, uh, industry, private sector, government policy, everybody works together, international organizations as well. So, so I think that uh, how can we share the technology for the benefit of the mankind uh, is absolutely, uh, we, we need more, uh, uh, industrial uh, uh, and also uh, uh, private sector to coming forward, uh, including the public and NGO sector as well. So that's number one that we have to really uh, openly working together. Uh, secondly, is that uh, we we have to, we are getting into a digital economy now. Uh, for example, here in China, we have uh, 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 you know almost uh, uh, thirty six percent of our national economy is generated by digital economy. So I think if if that is the digital world, we we we, you know, digital economy probably in the future where knows no boundaries and then really needs everybody work to, to, together and connected. We cannot decouple, we cannot be isolated. We have to really be uh, united and work together and create a better uh, wealth for the mankind. And uh, thirdly, I think that we really need uh, more international uh, inter student exchanges. And China now, for example, we, we are, uh, uh, sending uh, almost 700,000 students a year uh, to every country uh, around the world. I mean, that talent flow cannot be uh, really stopped or, or being uh, uh, politi politicized and, uh, on that. I, I really think that is really great. And China also welcomes more international students coming to China to, to do more uh, Chinese uh, 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 studies as well. And for example, in, in Hainan Island, uh, 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 Naba has been designated as special a free trade port of, of China. They opened a new island uh, called the International Education Island. Welcome international universities to, 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 to go there to settle as independent status. I think that is really a, a great initiative. Uh, and, and finally, I think that uh, we really need to get all the uh, academics, uh, international uh, organizations, universities, uh, business, the working together because we we should really be uh, not be affected by the by the uh, political uh, uh, you know uh, narrative that is so negative. I think the uh, the science science and technology has no no borders. I mean, uh, <laughs> science has uh, and the technology has to work together. So so I'm really think that uh, we need an open spirit. We need an open uh, society. We need an open uh, uh, cooperation and and. Uh, China uh, absolutely is also in that uh, drive. China, for example, the, the multinational has set up thousands of R&D centers in China. You know, we have Microsoft, IBM, whatever, you know, my, uh, Mercedes-Benz, BMW, you name it. Every multinational has an R&D center in China. So, so we have to share that uh, 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 you know, R&D uh, to the world. So I, I would really encourage more openness and more uh, exchanges among uh, the business, academics, uh, uh, and also across the board, uh, scientific uh, uh, institutions to work together, and international organization, of course, WHO, WTO, uh, uh, World Bank, and and uh, all, all the rest. So, so I'm I'm, I'm really uh, uh, really appreciate the organize for take such an initiative uh, at such a right timing, and also 
uh, we hope that this can be really uh, uh, be effective and also uh, can really uh, uh, affect many, many people that are involved in this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Um, you've given me a lot to think about there. And uh, you mentioned talent, which I won't talk about because that's the subject of the next uh, session here. But you, both, both you and Remy mentioned climate change. Um, and I think really thinking about the lessons that we've learned through the COVID pandemic, about the way that we collaborate, not just internationally, but also public-private partnerships, global partnerships, partnerships even within giant uh, technology and uh, pharmaceutical companies, which has been good to see. S Stefan, I'd like to come back to you though on the issue of climate change, because you know I know that this is a subject that's very, very close to your heart. And you know what do you think maybe are the lessons that we might have been learning from, from the COVID pandemic that we can apply to this you know, equally, if not more important, global challenge? Yes, uh, uh, it's very close to my work because I'm the commissioner for green hydrogen of the German federal government. So <laughs> uh, it's my daily business uh, to talk to uh, industries and uh, to a lot of uh, companies and politicians and all over Germany and Europe uh, to, uh, about this climate change and what can we do. And green hydrogen is a game changer uh, in this sense. And uh, so we uh, all adopted the uh, Paris climate uh, goals and that's uh, obligation for all uh, for all countries in the world. And so it's not only about to decarbonize uh, the German uh, economy or the European co economy. It's also to decarbonize, for example, the African industry. We have projects with Southern Africa because uh, uh, nearly the whole uh, economy in Southern Africa is based on coal. Uh, and they have millions. Uh, there's one refinery with 60 million tons of CO2 emissions a year. Uh, and now we go there to help them to decarbonize and build up our own uh, value chain um, uh, in South Africa, because it doesn't help us when we produce uh, synthetic fuels with the CO2 of this company <laughs> to make us happy with synthetic uh, fuels, uh, but they still have uh, these emissions, so it doesn't help the world um, together. So. And these are uh, global projects we are, um, we are trying also with the Ministry for, for, for Education and Research um, to, um, to collaborate also with countries in, in Asia and the United States and all over Europe to find together solutions for the climate change um, with green hydrogen. I sort of feel that um, I sort of feel like we, we need to be open, not just about research and innovation, but we need to be open about the way that we collaborate <laughs> and share our understanding of what works in our collaborative models and, and what doesn't work. And um, one thing that, that has been raised, I think, throughout this conference has been um, the importance of collaborating with people with, with, with shared values. Um, which has always kind of puzzled me as to as to you know why would you collaborate with somebody that doesn't have shared values? Do you, do you think this is a as an important thing to to bear in mind, or or do you think that we're overemphasizing the importance of values? Remy, perhaps I can talk to you first, and then may, and Henry, please please also if you could maybe think about this question too. Yeah, yeah I think certainly uh, values are uh, are important, and like for us in. Uh, in Quebec and Canada, if we think about, if we talk about uh, climate change with the many European countries, that's quite quite easy and straightforward. So and a lot of interaction. The past few years with our friend in the state, uh, with the scientists was open, <laughs> but of course with the I administration, uh, when, uh, when the, the president said, well, I don't believe much in climate change, that's a bit more challenging, but we have to continue. We had to continue developing the research activity. Uh, we have in Montreal, we host uh, Future Heart, the head office of Future Heart, and Future Heart head office also in the, in the US. So we're continuing to collaborate. So we were saying, yes, maybe for the time being, the AI administration doesn't share our values, but the academic world does, and many of the citizens of the US. So we will continue. We need to continue. And maybe on climate change, I hope that. Uh, from the pandemic, uh, where of course citizens are very much affected by the pandemic, they see their loved one dying from it or being very sick. We hope that we'll be able to bring that as close, climate change, what does it mean for me on my street or in my city? And that's something we need to work on together to bring that to that level, I think. Henry, your reflections too, please? 
Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Gail. And also thank you, Rimi, uh, talking about Canada, Montreal. I used to live in Montreal for a few years, working for SNC Laval and all Quebec government as well. But but I think you're right, you know, for the climate change, we, we probably have all the universal values for that. You know, we, we have to prevent uh, uh, the, the human race, uh, uh, you know, being uh, uh, affected by the, you know, the climate change. But I think how we get there, you know, uh, by uh, what kind of uh, way to get there. For example, you know, the Chinese economy is, is really a hybrid of, of multinationals, private sectors, SOEs. So it's probably a bit more effective in the Chinese setting in handling the COVID-19. For example, now there's no single case occurring in China locally uh, uh, for 1.4 billion country. Uh, uh, but, but of course, uh, you know, there may be some methodology uh, or, or the way to do it. There's a little uh, uh, different views in different parts of the world. But I think in the end, we have to test it by, uh, uh, you know, the bottom line and what Deng Xiaoping, uh, the Chinese former leader said, it, it, it doesn't matter is white cat, black cat, as long as cat is mine. So if China can lift 800 million people out of poverty and uh, can contribute over one third of a global GDP growth, I think given the time, people would really think, you know, maybe they have a different uh, uh, value or, or uh, culture, but but it's not the end of the history. You know, we, we need to uh, have a little different, uh, more tolerance of a different system. So uh, if that really contributes to the world at large. So so I think that uh, value does matter, but uh, uh, but maybe uh, can be also interpreted a little differently sometimes by, by different people. But I think in the end, we have to, Really, see what contribute, what's the bottom line, and what what uh, what can be done to to really help the hu humankind in the end. So, so, so that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you, and I, I'm I'm really pleased to see that sort of engagement with civic society has has come up uh, by all three of you, and the importance of that. I I have a background in public engagement, and. Uh, I know that it can be very, very difficult and the challenges of public engagement, um, not least to reach out to people who feel disenfranchised by science, technology, governments and so forth. Um, and, and like you said, Remy, to, to, to really bring it back to what does it mean for me? So, Stefan, would you like to maybe comment a little bit about what you see might be the importance of rethinking the way that we collaborate in an open way with society? Every uh, research programs um, uh, we we have we now discuss with the civil society the um, topic of science communication is very um, important uh, become uh, is becoming very important in Germany and we have a lot of uh, ideas of uh, of, of uh, citizen science for example um, to discuss all our research uh, projects and ideas with the um, with the civil society so it's uh, really really important. Uh, point uh, and I want to add some uh, words to Henry. Um, thank you for your um, that you're highlighting the student exchanges, which are really very important uh, for international collaboration. And um, it's great that you send 700,000 students a year uh, all over all around the world. So um, that was an important remark for me. Thank you. Thank you. So we have it just a. Um... Two, two or three minutes left, and I just wanted to um, let you know, all three of you, you may not be aware that uh, yesterday we had Commissioner Gabriel uh, at, as part of our conference, and she she underscored actually the messages that we're, that we're talking about today, and she said that she announced the Commission will be updating its approach to international cooperation in research and innovation later in the year. So if you were to give her one piece of advice what what would it be? Um, I'll start with 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 you, Remy, and then maybe Henry and Stefan. I think it's already uh, there and it's part of the discussion today. But I will say, uh, be very open, <laughs> uh, all the way you know, from uh, the EU to other country, and from the other country to uh, to the EU. So exchange of students, yes, for sure, but exchange of talent at all level. Because I think uh, the big challenge over the next few years will be will be a brain power. Uh, we talk a lot about artificial intelligence, but we need human. <laughs> we need human brain, and that will be there will be a lot of um, competition. I say for 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 the best the best brain. So if we can collaborate more with uh, with Europe on that on that front, be great. Thank you, and and, and Henry, your reflections. 
Yes, absolutely. I, I, I tuned in last night and I uh, heard that. Uh, absolutely. I think the, my, my uh, personal advice for, for you would be that we see the talent, you know, uh, U.S. as a magnetic, uh, North America as well, uh, uh, for, for a long time as a magnet for the global talent. Uh, but China now is the, one of the largest producers now of talent. I, I see EU, a uh, European country, can play a huge role because they have a long history, uh, and not ge geographically uh, located between China and U.S., and then, and then, you know, they can play a lot of uh, uh, matching, making roles, and actually also uh, can be a, a great a third party to really facilitate the global talent uh, circulation and exchange so that uh, uh, Europe can get, get upgraded on R&D and also uh, China can get, uh, get upgraded on that. U.S. can also maintain its uh, lead, uh, lead on that. So I think it's a win-win for all of us. So if the European can play a more active role, uh, it can certainly uh, get a, getting a relation better between uh, all countries, particularly U.S. and China. Like I just, uh, a, few, a few days ago, we, we, we have one of our uh, delegates ask a question at Munich Security Conference to the Secretary General that we really need a global efforts and and EU can play a huge role on that. Thank you. And, and, and Stefan, your fi final words to you. Yes, three thought messages. Uh, strengthening the collaboration with China uh, based on values. Uh, re-strengthening the collaboration to the United States uh, after a new president is elected and look for countries uh, like Hungary and Poland in the European Union um, to make clear what is uh, open society and open science was in Europe. Thank you so much, all, all three of you, for sharing all of your views here with us today. It's much, much, much appreciated.